Hello and welcome to this edition of Live and Ticking. The topic of today's event is what is Takatsubo? I'm Fergal McKinney, head of BHF Northern Ireland. Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, sometimes referred to as broken heart syndrome or acute stress-induced cardiomyopathy, is a sudden and often temporary cardiac condition which can mimic the symptoms of a heart attack. It's often triggered by extreme emotional or physical stress. However, the precise cause of Takatsubo cardiomyopathy isn't fully understood yet. It's a serious and sometimes life-threatening condition. And one person who knows that all too well is our first speaker today, Matt Paulson. Matt will be kindly sharing his experience of Takatsubo cardiomyopathy was with us in a short while. We're also joined today by BHF Clinical Research Fellow at the University of Aberdeen, Amelia Rudd, who's going to take us through her research into understanding what factors influence recovery from this condition. And for the Q&A session, we'll also be joined by senior cardiac nurse Regina Giblin to help answer your questions. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible during Q&A. However, if we are unable to answer your question, then you can call our heart helpline and speak directly to one of our cardiac nurses. You can also join our Health Unlocked community forum for support. This forum provides a safe space to discuss living with any heart or circulatory diseases. Finally, before we hear from our speakers, I'd like to ask you a quick poll question. How would you rate your understanding of Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? And one is very little and five is a lot. I'll give you a little second just to uh, answer that poll. And while you're doing that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker today, Matt Polson. We here at the BHF have a very special connection to Matt, as he's also the co-founder of OMEAS. And you'll all know what OMEAS is. It's a fundraising organisation known for their incredible million pound house draws that raise money for various different charities. The British Heart Foundation first partnered with OMEAS in 2020 to raise an incredible a million pounds for life-saving cardiovascular research. In December 2022, we were proud to partner with Amaze for a second time. This time, the draw raised an outstanding £2 million to help fund vital research into heart and circulatory diseases. But what you may not know is that Matt's connection to the BHF goes beyond the money Omaze has raised for us. Five years ago, extreme physical stress caused Matt to develop Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which left him fighting for his life. We're very grateful to have Matt here today to share his story with us, and he'll be joined by Yana Theodoro from the research engagement team at the BHF. Over to you, Matt and Yana. Hi, Matt. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Yana. I'm excited to be here. Wonderful. Um, well, why don't we start off with you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background and your job? Obviously, that's very interesting to us. <laughs> Yes, of course. As uh, as Mr. McKinney uh, shared, I'm the I'm the co-founder of Omaze. Um, we started Omaze 11 years ago uh, in the United States when we started with uh, offering the chance to win celebrity experiences to benefit charities, and we did everything from you know riding a tank with Arnold Schwarzenegger and crush things to win a Lamborghini where Pope Francis hands you the keys. That was probably the craziest one we ever did. Um, I had to go to the Vatican and pitch Pope Francis, which was a unique experience. Um, and then uh, over time, we evolved to offering things that we could control. Um, vacations, and then we started doing watches, and then we started doing sneakers, and then we started doing cars. And eventually said, you know, what would really work well is houses. Um, houses are really emotional for people. Um, it's, you know, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's safety, it's security, it's status. Um, and we decided to test that in the UK first. Um, and it really just took off here. Um, one of our big breakthroughs was the, was that Fulham house that we did with you guys. It's a very special place in our heart. And, um, and, you know, it grew so fast and was having such an impact that we moved the headquarters and focused solely on houses. And so now I live in London, we're based out of London and, uh, you know, we get to help amazing organizations like you guys. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I've seen so many of those videos where they get told that they've won the house. So yeah, that's a fun. That's fun. Yeah. Um, so turning to your story of Takasubo, if we may, this all began when 
you were born with the condition. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I was born with my stomach twisted in a knot and they did what's called an iliac atresion to to basically untwist it. They removed a good percentage of my small intestine. And then in the scar tissue from that surgery kind of freakishly broke off all these years later um, and and created this bowel obstruction. And, you know, I was at work and my, my stomach uh, started to look like it was two months pregnant. The next day it looked like I was five months and then seven and then nine. And finally I called my friend as a doctor and said, I, something's going on here. Uh, I'm throwing a party tonight. I'd like to be there, but I just want to make sure I, I, uh, I, I'm okay. And he said, I think you should go to the hospital. And basically what had happened is the, uh, was the stress of the bowel obstruction ended up triggering Takotsubo. And I can talk about everything that happened there. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that caused a lot of pain, I'm guessing. Um, well, from it was extreme pain. About. Yeah. It was extreme pain. Yeah. So when you um, yeah, went to the hospital, what, what did the doctor say? And, and when did things start, start to become more serious? Yeah. So they, uh, when I, when I went to the hospital, they didn't, they did all these tests and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, and I was there all day and my, my parents came and then our COO, her name is Helen came and, you know, they did more tests. And then they finally said to them, like, look, we can't figure out what it is. You guys go home. We're going to keep Matt overnight. And if he's not better by the morning, then we'll do surgery then. So uh, my parents went home. Helen went home. Helen um, pull, was pulling into her driveway. And it was about it was midnight at this point. She'd been in the, hall, the hospital all day. She was exhausted. And she was going to get out of her car. But something, something was telling her to go back to the hospital. And Helen is... British. She's a COO. She's very serious. She's not like a Venice beach, listen to the cosmos type person, but the, the voice was undeniable. Uh, so she drove back and if she hadn't driven back, I would have probably died like within a couple hours because, mm -hmm. because of the Takotsubo, my blood pressure had plummeted. Um, and they, uh, and they didn't know why. And, um, and the, my, the, the machines hadn't learned had not alerted the nurses. So Helen went and got a doctor and said, look at this, this looks really bad. And the doctor took one look um, and called in a crash team. They rushed me down to the surgery. I came out of surgery and they said to my mom, um, the good news is we figured out what it is. It was a bowel obstruction. The bad news is um, we, his heart rate's continuing to plummet we, and, and we don't know why. And he's in critical condition. Um, and then my dad or my mom went downstairs to get my dad and my brother a couple hours later. And she was coming back up over the elevator and she heard over the loudspeaker code blue in room 437. My mom works in a hospital. So she knows that means flatline. And she knew that was my room. So she got off the elevator and she ran down the hall and she got to the door and the nurse said, I'm sorry, you can't come in. This is really serious. My mom said, I was there when he came in this world. If he's leaving this world right now, I'm going to be in that room. Mm -hmm. So she let her in the room and, and I was flatlined. Uh, they were doing the, the compressions and the defibrillator. Um, and again, that was talking to that was causing it. We didn't know that at the time. Um, it caused a cardiac and, arrest. Yeah, it was yeah. causing the cardiac arrest. Um, and we didn't find this out till later, but, uh, but, you know, all my mom was experiencing was seeing her son there in front of her uh, passing. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to lose a child is nothing to be right there when it's happening. So she started to crumble. Um, mm -hmm. and at the same time, my dad was outside with my brother and this doctor came out and said to my, in front of my brother, not knowing it was my brother. Hey, like we, I think we lost this guy. I think he's gone. And so my dad, my brother pushed my dad in the room saying, you need to be there with mom. And so my, my mom's face this way towards me and my dad came in from this side and he was, he was crying so loudly. My mom turned away from me to him to say like, Gary, you gotta be quiet or they're going to kick us out of here. You know? And, uh, and she said when she did that, when she, when she turned to say that, she said she saw something she'd never seen before in a hospital. She said every nurse and every staff member and every doctor in the ICU had just gravitated outside the window. And there was like 40 of them 
and they look like this silent church choir just sending in this positive energy. Mm-hmm. And my mom was so moved by these people that she was looking at that were sending love to this person that they didn't even know. It just filled her up with strength. You know, and yeah. she started coaching me. And she said, Matthew David Polson, these people are fighting to save your life. They're fighting so hard to bring you back, but you're not fighting hard enough. You need to fight harder. Um, and they said it was a surreal experience I because <laughs> I listened to my mother. I'm still scared of my mother to this day, and I do whatever she tells me to do. Um, and, you know, she, they said it was surreal watching it because you know, we've all seen Grey's Anatomy. Like, there's never a, a 65 year old mother in the room, you know, in the most intense operating situation, but she was in there and the flat line from the Takatsubo went on for four and a half minutes, you know, and they don't always fight that long. Um, but because she kept fighting, they kept fighting. Um, but then at one point she thought to herself, this has gone on too long. You know, like I'm, I'm going to lose my son. You know, and if I lose my son, I'm going to, I'm going to lose my husband, you know, and, and her, uh, her mind went there. Um, and right as her mind went there, the main doctor kind of uh, shook his head as this to say, like, this is, this is done. And he turned away. And my mom kind of grabbed his arm and, you know, pleaded and said, please don't, don't call it yet. And right as she did that, he turned back towards me and said, wait a second. I think we have a pulse. And then they're just watching the, you know, the, the machine go along. And all of a sudden, as they're watching it, all of a sudden, my eyes just opened up and I just kind of slowly said, I slowly lifted my right arm and like gave a thumbs up. Wow. Wow. That's, that's a lot. Um, it's a and, lot. Yeah. It is a lot. Um, and, and when did the doctors realize it was Takasuba? Because obviously at the time they, they're just seeing you going to cardiac arrest. What happened, what happened in following this experience? Um, so after that i went like right back into a coma and then they had to do um they had to do this crazy procedure where they connected me to an ecmo machine but they had to bring the ecmo machine to me so it was the first mobile transport of an ecmo machine an ecmo patient in the in the history of the u.s and there's all this other crazy stuff that happened to get them to approve doing that um and and then you know they they there was a bunch more tests and stuff like that. Um, and they really didn't get a beat that it was Takatsubo for probably another day or two um, while I was still kind of in the coma on the ECMO. Um, and then I kind of had this miraculous recovery from the ECMO. Um, again, something they couldn't really explain medically. They, they didn't know how to explain it, but but it happened. And, uh, and then by that time, a couple of days into it, they had figured out that it was it was the the cardiac arrest had been triggered by Takatsuba, Takatsuba, which had been triggered by the extreme pain. Yeah, yeah. And and have you had any issues with your heart since? What's your recovery been like? Yeah, no, I haven't. I mean, um, Takatsuba is such an extraordinary condition, um, and oftentimes it's driven by an outside force or more often than not that's what it's uh driven by and so it's not it wasn't anything endemic to my heart um Mm -hmm. it was just the extreme stress of the situation and and in fact you know i had an angioplasty i had a bunch of stuff happen to my heart that like you know cleaned it out and um and so you know they say i have no more probability of it happening again than anyone else who's never had one it was really just that extreme situation and in many ways my my heart's even healthier as a result. Good to hear. And just one last question before we wrap up and hand over. Like, how has this experience changed the way that you live your life? You know, it's it's changed me profoundly. Um, it It's helped me choose love over fear at, at every moment. You know, I think... Um, I think everything is a choice between love and fear. You know, the opposite of love isn't, isn't hate, it's fear. Right. And, and so often we, we, um, we make decisions from that place we're human. Um, and so I work really hard to, to make decisions from a place of love, from a place of expansion. I also believe 
and things that I didn't believe in before. I believe that the the power of love is much it's much more uh, omnipotent than I ever realized. Uh, you know, I was on the other side. I was gone for four and a half minutes. I had a full experience of coming to the light experience and I experienced a sense of oneness and totality. Um, you know, I mean, phys you know, physicists have already proven that at some level we're all interconnected um, and that there is a universal, you know, a fundamental like substrate. Um, and I believe that is love, that, that, that oneness of energy at some physical level is love um and therefore i think if you put it out um and you practice it and you and you overcome your fear to get to it you can you can change the course of things uh in really profound ways mm -hmm. um you know and i think that's really just a frequency you, you know you're putting out um and so it's you know it's i was way more ego driven before um i was way more reserved in telling people that i love them um and I was, and probably the last thing I'll say is I, I was, uh, I'm way more loving to myself, you know, and I, you hear that all the time. You got to love yourself first. You got to, you know, and you think, you know what that means, or at least I thought I know what that means, but I didn't, you know, mm -hmm. I would hold grudges against myself. I would criticize myself. I would be pretty mean to myself, not realizing it. Um, and it's helped me to not, not do that as much. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And obviously it's a, it's a, an astonishing experience. So thank you for sharing it with us. Um, thank you for back asking. Over to you. No worries. Back over to you, Virgil. But I was just saying, Matt, that was profound. And thank you very much indeed for sharing your story with us, your astonishing story with us today. Our second speaker is BHF Clinical Research Fellow, Amelia Rudd, who's looking into this condition and its recovery. Over to you, Amelia. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Amelia Rudd, and I am a British Heart Foundation Research Fellow at the University of Aberdeen. I am a research student with an interest in echocardiography, and I have been working with um, the University of Aberdeen on various Takosuba research projects for many years. And I have recently been fortunate enough to be awarded the British Heart Foundation Fellowship for Allied Health Professionals. My project is called the Epidemiology and Predisposition of Takasuba Cardiomyopathy, and it is a data study analyzing electronic health records. Takasubo was first reported in Japan in the 90s. It is an acute form of left ventricular systolic dysfunction, and it is often triggered by an episode of intense emotional or physical stress. It presents exactly like a heart attack, and it is usually only diagnosed when the patient is found to have normal coronary arteries when they perform the cardiac angiogram. The echocardiogram, or the jelly scan of the heart, will typically show apical ballooning of the left pumping chamber of the heart. And although other variants such as the basal or the focal variants have also been described in the literature recently. Now the name Takosubo comes from, is, originates in Japan where the first case was found because the left ventricle or the left pumping chamber of the heart resembles the shape of an octopus trapping pot, which is called the Takosubo. Now, Takosubo occurs mostly in middle-aged women with a female to male ratio of 9 to 1. And this condition, although initially thought to be reasonably benign, can have significant in-hospital complications, such as pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock, the left ventricular rupture, and even death. And even though recovery was also initially thought to be complete, Recovery rates can vary and can be very slow and protected with some people still suffering from symptoms of breathlessness and reduced exercise capacity for many months after the event and in some cases even longer. Now the research conducted in our unit has found that many patients go on to develop a type of heart failure but to date the cause and the natural history of this condition is still unknown and also do not yet have guidelines for treatment available in the literature. Two global registries, the InterTAC registry and 
the Swedish Cat Lab Registry have reported that Takosuba syndrome has similar long-term outcomes as a myocardial infarction. But these registries represent patients that are extracted from many nations, a mixture of them, without including data for a whole nation. And it also does not include prescribing data. So even though these registries provide valuable information about Takosubo, they do not report on the specific causes of death or the prescribing data. Um, Scott, uh, Takosubo syndrome also does not yet have its own code in the International Classification, classification of Diseases or the ICD-10 system. And these cases are currently coded under these three codes, which are the codes for other rare cardiomyopathies. Now, the benefit of conducting this study in Scotland is that all patients have got a community health index number, and we also have access to accurately maintained contemporaneous electronic health records. We were very interested to know how many cases there were in Scotland, and therefore I screened all the community health index numbers, or CHI numbers, that were coded under these three codes to see which patients in Scotland have had a Takosubo event. I also screened all the urgent angiography cases that did not proceed to coronary intervention, and this involved inspecting health records of all patients that were taken to the cath lab for an angiogram, but they did not have any stents fitted. And I traveled to all the participating health boards in Scotland to do this. Now, from this slide, it shows the incidence of the TACO SUBO cases across the health boards in Scotland. And as you can see quite nicely from figure one on the left and figure two on the right at the top, the incidence of Takosubo show a steady increase over these years. Um, we established the Scottish Takosubo Registry, or what we call the STAR study, and we included all the confirmed cases of Takosubo syndrome between 2010 and 2017. I also traveled to all the health boards and I collected all the relevant clinical information surrounding the TACO event by inspecting all the paper and electronic health records. Now, this would have included the echocardiograms, the angiogram results, blood pressure, heart rate, all the relevant information that we were looking at. The registry was then age and sex matched to a cohort of general uh, Scottish population controls at a ratio of one to four, and a myocardial infarction control cohort at a ratio of one to one. And this was done by Idris at Public Health Scotland. The TACO SUBA cases, the general Scottish population controls, and the myocardial infarction controls were then linked for deaths, hospital admission data, and prescribing data. And we set the censoring date for the 31st of May, 2021. The main hypothesis of my project is that there is an increased risk of mortality in patients with Takosubo's myocardiomyopathy or syndrome, and that this increased risk is mainly driven by cardiovascular causes. We were very interested in establishing the specific causes of death in these patients. We also wanted to establish their long-term clinical outcomes. And also we were look, um, trying to find out whether any of the conventional cardiovascular or non-cardiovascular therapies are associated with better survival. Now these results are our initial findings. And this slide shows the mortality in Takosubo syndrome when compared to general Scottish population controls and the myocardial infarction controls. The black line is the general Scottish population controls. The red line is the Takosubo syndrome patients. And the green line represents the myocardial infarction controls. As you can see from all of these um, 
days grass. Taco Subau falls somewhere in the middle between the general Scottish population and a heart attack. So this condition is not as benign as we initially thought. Now the two figures at the top show the overall mortality. This is all cause mortality death from any specific any causes following taco cardiomyopathy. And then we also investigated whether the risk of mortality is still increased if the patient survived beyond the first 30 days past the event. And as you can see from the slide on the right at the top, there's still an increased risk after the event, similar to what we see following a heart attack. Now the two figures at the bottom show the mortality from cardiovascular causes, and that's the one on the left, and from non-cardiovascular causes, and that's the one on the right at the bottom. Non-cardiovascular mortality is similar to those for the heart attack, and we have found that cardiovascular mortality in the patients with Takosubo is mainly due to heart failure causes. Okay, now our study also provides the first data regarding long-term medication use. And we had a look at cardiovascular medication and also non-cardiovascular medications. We looked at medications such as beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, antiplatelet therapy, statins and diuretics, or what people know commonly know as water pills. For the non-cardiovascular medications, we looked at steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs hormone replacement therapy, psychotropic medications, and thyroxin. And we also looked at whether the patients were prescribed medication for the majority of their follow-up period, or whether they received the medication at any time during the follow-up period. So basically, short-term and long-term medication use. Now, on the left, we have patients with Takotsubo syndrome. And on the right, we have patients that have had a heart attack. Now, when these lines that represent each medication fall to the left of the vertical line, it indicates that there is, it's associated with improved survival. When these lines are to the right of the vertical line, it means it's associated with poorer survival. And if these lines cross the vertical line, it means there's no effect whatsoever. Now, the only medication that is consistently associated with a poorer outcome is the diuretic, also known as the water pill. And from the non-cardiovascular medications, it's the psychotropic medication. We were quite excited because the ACE inhibitors initially showed if they used it for at any time during the um, short term, it appeared to have an effect. But unfortunately, this effect disappeared when they used it for the long term. And when you look at the myocardial infarction group on the right, we can see that the, the cardiovascular medications work in this group. But unfortunately, these medications do not work in Takosubo. But interestingly enough, patients with Takosubo have a similar rate of prescribing of these therapies, despite there being no clinical guidelines to guide these therapies. So our data show that there are no clear effects when using modern cardiovascular therapies. And this really just highlights the need for clinical trials to find out which medications will improve survival in Takosubo syndrome. So in conclusion, we have found that in patients with Takosubo syndrome, cardiovascular mortality is the leading cause of death and improved survival is not associated with any of the modern cardiovascular therapies. And at this point in time, I would just like to take the opportunity to thank the British Heart Foundation 
for the support that they have provided over the course of my career. They have, before awarding me the fellowship, which I believe was the first British Heart Foundation Allied Health Professional Fellowship in Scotland, they have also supported several of my training courses over the years. And this type of support is always very gratefully received when you work in the research field because funding is always very limited. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, thank you, Amelia, uh, for all your uh, hard work and research. Um, you'll be staying for questions. and We'll welcome Matt back uh, now, uh, along with uh, Regina Giblin, Senior Cardiac Nurse. Uh, and all, of course, to help answer your questions. Um, so, Matt, you won't be surprised. We're going to kick off with you. Uh, there were questions coming in almost straight away, actually, when you were doing... Um, uh, so the first one is, is about your recovery. What was that like afterwards? Um, it was... It was re it was really intense. I mean, I was on the ECMO machine um, for a while, and and as Amelia and Regina would know much better the the toll that that can that can take on you. Um, and then I and then so I was in the ICU for another ten days, and then um, I lost a, an incredible amount of weight. I was probably um, I got down to about twenty kilos lighter than the weight I am right now. Um, so I was very, very, very daunt. Um, and they, the surgery had gone through my, through my leg. And then the, there was a, there was also a bowel surgery through my stomach. And so, um, it took a while to get walking again and all that. But the main thing that they said, the most important part of my recovery was that people kept visiting and they said, I really needed to be around loved ones, uh, that there was a, like, that was a really important factor in terms of getting back. And then a lot of it was mental. Um, you know, it, it's hard to wrap your head around being told that you were saved and you were on the other side and making sense of that whole thing was, took me a, a while to, to process. Um, somebody else is asking, uh, is your experience of this why you've chosen to support the British Heart Foundation? We, uh, you know, it, it makes it all the more, um, it makes me all the more passionate about it. You know, I think the, the British Heart Foundation is such a well-respected and well-run organization. Um, you know, we've been, we'd love to get to know Charmaine and, the, the you know CEO and, and Claire, um, it's you know you guys just you guys do incredible work. You've touched people in so many different um, with so many different in areas of, of of heart disease and heart conditions and and, and around the country. That um, it was really the it was the reputation and the impact of the Bridge Heart Foundation is why we chose it. Um, this was another uh, this was another added kind of sense of connection but it was it was it was the work not my experience that led us to support the Sharp foundation yeah, well it's very very much appreciated not just by us but wider society as well um uh, question um maybe for regina and you matt but do you have any advice for people recovering from something like this regina if you kick off i would say um we're still learning about this condition and um, with this condition, it does take some time to get over. There will be a recovery period in hospital, but also it, uh, for most people, it takes a few weeks to a few months to get over this. Um, we do see majority of people actually do make full recovery. However, there are some individuals whose um, left ventricle, the main pumping chamber of the heart, the shape is still changed and they still experience chest pain. They still experience shortness of breath and they still experience fatigue. So they'll have follow-up with their cardiologist and they'll have further tests such as the ultrasound of the heart, which is the echocardiogram. Um, and they may be on some cardiac medications for a while as well. And, um, you know, thanks for sharing your story, Matt. It was, it was, it was really powerful. Um, one of the things that, that struck me was it was the physical distress that your body had gone under, why this condition happened. But for others, it's the emotional stress so um, that triggers the condition. 
So, you know, if there's an emotional distressing situation happening in someone's life and it triggers this condition, then there may be some psychological impact that may need to be looked at from an individual's point of view um, to go to their GP and maybe seek some talking therapies or cognitive behavioral therapy to talk about whatever situations happen in their life that actually triggered this quite, you know, serious condition. Okay. Uh, a number of other people are asking, is Takotsubo considered heart failure? And maybe, Regina, if you want to kick off, and Amelia, if you want to come in on that, possibly, possibly not. Well, I would say that we describe Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, one of, that's one of the terms we use to describe the whole condition. Cardiomyopathy describes um, heart muscle diseases. Um, so in, in some respects, it is a type of heart failure, but it's more to do with the heart failure symptoms, such as breathlessness, tiredness. Um, but hopefully over time, this person recovers and doesn't have heart failure symptoms for a long time. But as I said earlier, it can progress to that for people for longer. So they may need to be on, on uh, drug therapies and to, to see a cardiologist um, more frequently. Um, Amelia, what would you say about the echocardiogram for people with, 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 um, with Takotsubo syndrome and having it long term with regards to heart failure? Well, research that we've done in our, um, our unit um, a couple of years ago, we actually had a look at patients that have had a Takotsubo event and we followed them up a year later and we found that quite a large, not a huge proportion, but about 50% of them did actually go on to develop a type of heart failure. And even though the uh, echocardiograms, the you know, it's got a pumping action and also re relaxation, but and it's also got a twist and a torsion. And for some of those patients, some of the untwist and some of the apical regions are still affected for a long time after that, and they still continue to suffer from um, breathlessness and reduced exercise capacity for quite a long time. I mean, some of the patients we followed up more than a year after the events and these symptoms were still very much present. Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt, over to you. Um, you did refer to the fact that you probably had no more chance of getting it than the general population now, but somebody's inquiring, are you still more at risk of this happening? And, and in that context, have you to be more mindful to manage stresses? From what my doctor told me that I, I don't have any more risk than anybody else, um, I think any time you go through something like that, even even though it was an outside condition and kind of a, a freakish thing, it, it makes you examine everything. Um, so I do try to live a live a more balanced life. You know, doing a startup and getting Omaze off the ground was a hundred hour a week job for many years, um, and so I have worked to to continue to find the balance with my my diet and my fitness and, and all those things. I've, I've always been passionate about that, but I mean, I think I would even taking that to another level since then, but also making sure I'm spending more quality times and being, being present with friends and family. I think that's the biggest difference probably in just really prioritizing that you realize how short your time here is on this planet when you go through something like that and how little time you actually have with the ones you love when you really think about it. Yes, and, and just um, I'm going in order of questions here, uh, so some of them aren't necessarily linked, so uh, it'll jump from sort of the, the sure. question dictates the direction here, if you like. So, um, and something that struck me with you, you said, with Matt, obviously was you know you were the, the diagnosis came very late in the in the whole process, but how is it diagnosed, guys? How how, how is that? Maybe Regina. Well, um, as Amelia I mentioned in her presentation. People, when they present, they present like a heart attack. So they've got uh, sudden chest pain. They've got breathlessness. They may have palpitations. Also, they can have ECG changes, which is similar to heart attack. So the first step would be is that people are treated as if they're having a heart attack. So they would have to have a look at the arteries. So most people would have an angiogram to check the blood supply to the heart. And if the arteries are unobstructed or the blood flow is good through the heart, you know, they can also do a test within the angiogram, which is an um, F-ventricle, I can't remember the rest of the word, but basically they, they inject the dye and they check how the, how the dye is pumping out of the heart to represent how the blood flow is going out of the heart. And then they would also do an echocardiogram. 
Um, so diagnosis is done by an angiogram, an echocardiogram, an ECG, blood tests. Um, so all these things would indicate um, if it's not a heart attack, not a blood supply problem, and they can see the actual image of the heart muscle, the way it's tapered and at the top, the apical and the left ventricle is, is, is kind of wide and, and the heart muscle is weakened, then they can see that it's tachycardia syndrome. Um, is there anything to add, Amelia, about that? Um, oh, there was a lot of, um, when I start looking at the early attacker super cases that were diagnosed, some of them were only diagnosed when they had returned for a follow-up appointment, maybe four months later, because then the LV has returned back to normal function. And also sometimes if a patient goes to an angiogram, sometimes they only get the angiogram maybe four or five days later after the event. By then the normal, you know, the LV function has, you know, appears to have recovered back to normal. So it's quite a complex condition to, to diagnose. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And tell me, is the structure of the heart a permanent change or can it be reversed? Regina, you touched on that earlier a bit. I think in some people, it, it, there can be permanent change, but in most people, from what we know, um, it doesn't it doesn't remain a permanent change, that it does go back to normality. Um, but I think Amelia would be more expert on that because she's been looking at these scans for a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, we, we recently published about... Um, one of our researchers also did some, like I said, you know, the heart's got a twisting and a, you know, apical yeah. twist and torsion. So even though functionally it looks to be okay, your ejection fraction has returned to normal, some of the twisting and rotation function remains impaired. And these are subtle changes that you don't always see on a normal echocardiogram. We just noticed them because that was specifically what we were looking at. And does your research, Amelia, extend to how long it takes people to recover? Um, part of our previous ones, yes, our previous how long, studies. How my, long it varies. It, um, it was typically um, considered between, you know, at four months, recovery was considered complete. But unfortunately, it's not always the case in all patients. My study looks at um, how long, you know, um, mortality after tachycardia myopathy and also a, a further part of my study is going to be look at how patients are utilizing healthcare afterwards so what they get admitted comorbidities after the event as well but that research is still ongoing at the moment. Okay, Matt just over to you how long do you think it took before you were fully back up and match fit? About four months. Wait. Yeah hard four months I'd say it was tough that's a long time in startup world too yeah. I had you know no contact with my company so it was it was kind of that was I hadn't taken four minutes off bef you know in the, in the many years before that so it was it was it was good though you learned a lot of lessons by stepping back yeah absolutely um Amelia somebody wants to know what um what drew you to this area of research I started working um at the cardiac research office a couple of years ago and it, when we actually started there was one lady that was in the ward and she spoke to professor dawson because there was not a lot of information about the condition back in the, at the time and she just suggested why don't we start looking at taco subo and it was just a comment from a patient that started our us on our research journey and Taco Suba is basically our department's bread and butter. <laughs> We've done various studies on this over the years. I I suppose I quite I like echocardiography and that's my focus of my research, but because there's so little known and we've got access to all these healthcare records, it's very important to use it for public interest and to find out as much information as we can from what is available so readily in Scotland. You know, it's just a pure enjoyment actually working with Takasuba. And I work with the patients as well because part of my research project, um, we've identified all the patients in Scotland that have had Takasuba and we've also recontacted them to see whether they would take part in our genetic study as well. And then you travel around Scotland and you actually meet these people. And it's really very interesting to make contact with some of these Taco Super patients because they've got some very powerful stories. Yeah. And another question I want to know, you've just alluded to it a bit, but what's next for your research? 
What's next is obviously the genetic aspect as well. Um, we've got two other studies in our department that's also recently finished. That's part of my, my colleague's research, and that is the, um, the exercise intervention one in Paco Subo. And also to have a look at um, uh, the brain scans and also with exercise capacity, um, exercise um, regimes and cognitive behavioral therapy. And those studies are complete. So the, I'm probably, my main focus at this moment is data analysis to get as much information out there as what we possibly can. And then carrying on with the genetic aspect as well to see if there's a genetic element in Takatsubo mm -hmm. okay. Another question I wanted to know, could Takatsubo syndrome be delayed? And they mean it in this sense, could it manifest some time after extreme physical, emotional stress? Yes, we have actually had patients that have had an event in it. What we call, um, we actually collected this information as part of my study. We had looked whether a patient had an acute event and we had looked at uh, how long after the event they were actually admitted to a hospital. And we also had looked to see whether somebody had what we call an insidious onset. So something that grumbled along over a long period of time. So we do have that information, but we've not analyzed it yet. And that's also part of the next bit of my, my research. And another question I wants to know, um, uh, do, can people have more than one event? Oh, yes. Um, and there are, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Yes, we've had one case in, in Aberdeen. I think she said about eight events. Yeah, so it does happen. The rec uh, recurrence rate um, is approximately about 15%. For some, you know, but um, also with this data, I can actually be able, I'll, I'll be able to pinpoint accurately exactly how many cases, how many events have had past the first one. So that's also part of my study as well. So we'll be looking at that index as well. Glad to hear these next two questions because it shows the extent of the audience, guys. Uh, do you know if there's any study groups in Canada, says one, and, and the other says, I'm in the US, where is research being done uh, there regarding Takotsubo? Um, all I can say is probably the best place to check whether there's any research projects ongoing in the, a, a specific country is to look at clinicaltrials.gov and to see where the studies are registered because it's got to be kept up to date. Most researchers, when they do clinical research, they have to register it on a, on a system. And most people do choose clinicaltrials.gov. So that's a, a good place to check. I have had patients that have taken part from Canada and from America because we're interested, because looking at the genetic aspect, we're trying to find um, family clusters because there's not a lot of family clusters available globally. And we've had, I think, two, one from Canada and one from America, family cluster, where it's a sister or a mom or two sisters that have taken part in certain genetic samples. Um, a very specific one, is it always the left ventricle which causes this syndrome? We have seen cases where the right ventricle is involved as well. So it's not always just limited to the left ventricle, no. Okay. Um, uh, so this is a comment more than a question. It says Takatsubo mimics a heart attack. So that is, they're saying what the paramedics would pick up on in the first instance. Um, somebody's looking to access research. I'm very interested in the exercise input post Takatsubo. And if there's, we, we can do that. We'll follow up with that question directly with you. Um, um, let me see. Some others are very interested, Matt, in, 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 in your story. I have to say uh, the questions were, were flooding in. I've covered them in a couple of ways. Uh, but how much have you changed your lifestyle? I think this is the most, it's the, it's the one question people, they're intrigued by your story, I think is really what we're saying. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, I think from the outside, I haven't changed it fundamentally but from the inside i've changed it a lot if that makes sense uh, i was doing omaze before this um you know i was working hard then i'm still working hard now um, i've always been very healthy i mean when this happened my friends you know were always like how does this happen and to matt he's our healthiest friend you know i in terms of just diet and exercise and and those kind of things i was living a very california lifestyle um but I, th I think um, 
internally it's changed the way I live a lot. As I said before, uh, how I kind of talk to myself, uh, you know, I think a lot of the stress that we create in our life comes from ourself, um, from the way that we talk to ourselves. Um, and so that has been, I like fundamentally I've, I've learned to be kind of more of a best friend, uh, give myself some slack, not be so hard on myself. Um, I spend less time like comparing myself to others or worrying about what others think. Uh, and I, and then I very, I really do diligently try to share love more, you know, wh whether it's a quick text message to someone to say that I'm thinking about them, just this engagement with a stranger in a street, just smiling, um, or, you know, a bit of expression of love to a family member. Um, I'm much more active about doing that, like much more intentional about doing that, um, I think the, they've, you know, they've shown those studies um, if in the blue zones, if you guys are familiar with that, which is kind of a trendy thing right now, the areas in the world where people live to be 100 years old, and, uh, your, even small connections with people out on the street or or moments of smiling or connection can make a big difference in your in your overall life. So, so I think that 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 element of my life has changed pretty fundamentally and I feel very different inside as a result of that. Good, and I must say once again, thank you for sharing. Um, th there's a further question in from somebody who's uh, in a post-Takotsubo position and uh, on particular cardiovascular medications. And is there more research? I think you may have alluded to this immediate happening to get more effective treatments. Is this for me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, and Regina, <laughs> if you're aware. I'm wholly unqualified to answer that question. <laughs> as, far, as far as I know, there are no ongoing trials at the moment, but um, the idea is there. So. Good. Regina, are you aware of uh, further research on that? I was just going to say that, um, as, as Amelia alluded to earlier with the presentation, um, they're still looking into treatments for this mm. condition we're still there's still a lot of unknowns and uh, it's very interesting to me that some of the medications that we use um, are to treat the symptoms um, of the actual you know condition um because we want to give medication that helps to help the heart function better so beta blockers and ACE inhibitors but in the long term you know how does that actually help the person so I think we're still learning basically um, whether that medication is effective in the long term but in the meantime, we still want to help people to feel better about, you know, their symptoms day to day if they have long term effects from having taco pseudo. Okay. Well, listen, everybody, thank you very much indeed, uh, Regina. Thank you very much for your input, Amelia. Thank you for your input and for your research. And Matt, thank you very much indeed for sharing your story. It is an inspiring one. And I have to say, um, you know, listening to you talk of how your mom watched as you nearly died mm. and then you know came back to life and that you have brought such uh, inspiration if you like in, uh, to others by sharing that story I think it's absolutely fantastic and um, uh, th just thank you thank you again and thank you to you all for watching this edition of live and ticking we hope you've enjoyed hearing from our brilliant speakers um, at the start, we did a poll. Um, we'd like to now ask you, which, how would you rate your understanding of Takotsudo cardiomyopathy on a poll of one to five? And uh, if we haven't managed to answer your question today, then we encourage you to visit our, visit our Heart Helpline, where you can contact our dedicated clinical team about your query. All of our incredible research is funded 100% by you, the public. If you've been inspired by the amazing science you've heard today, then all donations to support our life-saving work are very much appreciated. There's a link to donate should you wish to do so at the end of the event. Live and Ticking is a monthly webinar series and we strive to produce the best events possible for you, our audience. Your feedback and comments are crucial to help plan and develop future events. So we ask if you can complete the survey at the end of this event or through an email you'll receive in the coming days. This Live and Ticking event was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel from next week. In October, we'll be bringing you two events, a double bill on women's health. Tune in on Wednesday, the 18th of October, for a special edition of Live and Ticking uh, for World Menopause Day. 
uh, on the topic of menopause and the heart. Then on Wednesday, the 25th of October, join us for a second webinar on pregnancy and the heart. They're not to be missed. So register via the link in the chat box. Thanks again for joining us and goodbye.